This is an introductory lecture on evolution. In this lecture, I will briefly review history of evolutionary study. First, I will introduce you to a few key concepts to give you an understanding of the mechanism of evolution. Then we are going to take a look at the history of evolutionary idea and how Charles Darwin came up with the concept of natural selection that turned to be a central concept in biology. But first, let's answer a simple question. What is evolution? Evolution is a process during which the species change within the time. Long ago, before Charles Darwin wrote one of the most important books of our time called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, philosophers and naturalists were discussing the change that occur in species over time. Look at this 18th century French naturalist, mathematician, cosmologist, and encyclopedist, Comte de Buffon. He wrote, species had been conceived by nature and produced by time. Interesting statement, isn't it? Wasn't this statement about evolution? Yes, indeed. But he did not become as famous as Charles Darwin. Why? Because he did not provide what every thinker in the past was looking for. He could not provide the mechanism of evolution. Every time one hears the word of evolution, one immediately thinks of Charles Darwin. But why him? He is not the one who came up with the idea of evolution. The answer is because he is the one who provided a proof of evolution. His observation revealed the mechanism by which living world evolves. This mechanism is known as natural selection, by which competition and survival of the fittest plays a fundamental role. And in our days, the proof of his theory, especially with development of molecular biology and genetics, is overwhelming. You see, all types of living things, including humans, have small differences between the individuals in the species. If one of these differences allow the individual to live longer, they will likely have more offspring. As the trait is passed on, the population starts to look more like the successful individual. This is how the species change over time. Natural selection is a mechanism of evolution that occurs when the natural environment selects for or against a particular trait. This selective pressure or selective force causes certain genes to become more common in the population. The selective force or pressure could be temperature, weather conditions, level of UV radiation, presence of predators, air pollution, water pollution, food availability, presence of various infections, and many others. Natural selection occurs to group of organisms when the environment around them changes. Those individuals best suited to the new environment survive and reproduce more often and pass their characteristics on to the next generation. They pass their genes, including those that determine useful in the new environment traits. Those individuals in population less suited to the new environment die and fail to reproduce, or they do it less often. These poor characteristics get weeded out of the population. Their genes frequency decreases. An adaptation is a characteristic that arises due to natural selection that allows an organism to survive and reproduce in a new environment. There is such a thing as pre-adaptation. Pre-adaptation is a feature that an organism has evolved that accidentally becomes useful at doing something else. It is a random change that comes from existing genes that have changed through mutation, permanent random chemical change in DNA molecule itself. A gene is a section of DNA molecule. A gene may also remain unchanged through generations. 
but may change in its survival value if environment changes. To be more precise, evolution essentially involves a change in gene frequencies. Because of this, I hope you understand that individuals do not evolve, at least not in the sense that we consider it. Population evolves. All the genes of any population at any given time comprise the gene pool. And the ratio of various genes in that pool can change over time. As the ratio changes, evolution occurs. And during this Poor, and during this time, the poor characteristics get weeded out of the population. But what is poor or good characteristics? These features determined by the environment. What is good for one environment might be poor or deadly for another environment. Time is going and the environmental condition change. This is why the uh, what that is why what considered to be good characteristic for a certain organism yesterday might be neutral or even bad today. Biologists define two types of evolution: macroevolution and microevolution. Macroevolution, which refers to a large scale changes that occur by extended time periods such as formation of new species and groups. Macro means large. Evolution unrolling. The macro, the word macro is Greek and the word evolution is Latin. When we're referring to how the demise of dinosaurs left room for mammals to evolve or how chimpanzees and human last shared a common ancestor six, seven million years ago, we are talking about macroevolution. Speciation is a good example of macroevolution. Speciation is the fact that two isolated populations of a same species give birth to two different species. Let me give an example of how this is possible to happen. Let's say we had a population of the same species, like a population of all other organisms, they are a bit different from each other. These differences or variations are very important for survival of population. Because environment is changing slow but constantly, some traits might help population to survive. Let's take a look at the hypothetical organisms that live in a relatively similar environment. We will call this organism's population of X species. Here they are, organisms of the same species in the environment X, or we call this population of X species. Like any other organisms, they reproduce. Population begin grow bigger and bigger in number. And eventually they spread to different geographical locations looking for more food or less crowded spaces or simply by an accident and they ending up in the different location. So what uh, you see in this slide is population of X species that by one or another reason ended up in different environments. Because of the long distance between them or formation of mountains or other barriers, all three populations not only started to live and reproduce in different environments, but they ended up in the isolation from each other. Different traits that determined by their genes become more important than others, while others become useless or even harmful. All, all depends on the environment they are in. Occasionally, mutations occur as well. You see, mutations are mistakes during DNA replication. These mistakes can be harmful, which leads the species with the mutation die off, while some mutations might give an advantage trait to an organism. Species with advantage traits have more chance to survive and pass their genes to other generations. So with millions of years past, these populations become different species. Speciation occurred, formation of new species. If they meet with each other, uh, they will not be able to reproduce anymore. On this slide, you see how much organisms change. We have species X, Y, and Z. 
the environment selects species with different traits, those who will survive and those who will become extinct. What you just observed is a simplified form of nat natural selection. What also could happen is that environment X change within the time to environment N, and speciation occurred in the new environment. The initial species become extinct, uh, but they uh, give beginning to new species. Somewhat similar occurs during formation of new genera, families, orders, and classes. However, what I just showed you is a very simplified mechanism of natural selection. When we will cover genetics, I will introduce you to evolution in somewhat more details. It takes millions and millions of years for macroevolution to happen, except uh, especially to form uh, taxonomic groups. Microevolution is all about how does population differ from one each other. Remember I mentioned before that variations within species are very important. Even members of your family look different from one another. I do not have to tell you this, right? The speciations that we just looked at can be considered as a link between microevolution and macroevolution. What you see on this slide is the bacteria that causes in human sexually transmitted disease called gonorrhea. Perhaps you heard of this disease. It is also known as the club or the drip. The scientific name of this bacterium is Neisseria gonorrhoea. This is also known as gonococcus. So you see two bacteria together. They form union of two, and because of this, they also known as diplococci. Diplococci. Diplo means two or pair, and coxi means berries. When this bacteria gets into human body, it is immediately start multiplying. Infecting primary epithelial cells of the reproductive tract. This bacteria likes the temperature of human body. Moreover, it is moist and there are plenty of nutrients in the human body. So this bacteria feels very comfortable in human body. Eventually, it is, if it's not treated, the bacteria can spread from reproductive tract to other human organs. As you perhaps know, the discovery of penicillin in 1928 started like the golden age of natural product antibiotic discovery that peaked in the mid 1950s. In our days, gonorrhea were treated by a single shot of antibiotic. There were about 55 different antibiotics that were able to destroy Neisseria gonorrhea. Thus, we altered the environment and antibiotic became a selective force of pressure. This is how this used to work. With the antibiotic, we inject infected patient. And what happens? Antibiotic clears up the infection by killing invading bacteria. And infected individuals were cured of the sexually transmitted disease, or another way to say it, sexually transmitted infection. So we altered the environment in which Neisseria gonorrhea used to reside. As we established earlier, change of environment might trigger change of trait or traits in an organism. Remember I said earlier that even living organisms of the same species are diverse, they are not identical. There are always variations within species. This also applies to bacteria. They are like us, humans, diverse. And here is one strange bacteria in a population that spends energy on producing initially a useless chemical. Strange. Why well, it will spend energy on something that has no value or no purpose? What a weirdo one may say, but look what happens. When we introduce the antibiotic to the body, this once useless chemical starts playing an important role for the well-being of this particular bacteria. This chemical breaks down antibiotic. The wise bacteria that did not produce that chemical got wiped out. 
And what bacteria is now reproducing more and more? You are right. The one that had produced the chemical, or now we can say enzyme, that once was a chemical that had no function. So now the strange bacteria became a common. It still belonged to the same species. Speci speciation did not happen, but the gene for the trait of enzyme now is much more frequent than before. And therefore, antibiotic became useless. You perhaps know the name of this phenomenon as antibiotic resistance. We ended up having a strain of Neisseria gonorrhea that is antibiotic resistant. So in 2020, people got really scared because we ran out of antibiotic that were able to kill this bacteria. There was only one antibiotic that worked only 50% of its capacity. 50% of patients were not cured. So doctors turned to pharmaceutical companies asking for help. And the companies were saying, we are not interested in developing medications that cure diseases. We have no profit from this. I do not know the rest of the story, but eventually there was a new antibiotic developed that is working now. The question is how for how long? What I just showed you is an example of microevolution, micro when a gene determining antibiotic resistance becomes more frequent in population, causing its survival, I mean, survival of that bacteria. Here is another example of microevolution. Let's take a look at human skin color. So let's take a look at people with light and dark skin. Let's draw the skin cells. Here they are. Of course, they are eukaryotic, so we have to draw a nucleus inside them. We will fill them with some light color uh, that represents cytoplasm of the cell. Cytoplasm is the substance inside the cells that uh, includes all kinds of organelles except nucleus. To differentiate nuclear plasma, we'll shade it with different color. Inside the nuclear plasma, we have to put DNA molecule, the master molecule that has all the information about our body. And now we will draw melanin, a pigment that like an umbrella of a sunny side of the nucleus. Melanin protects the nucleus and DNA molecule within uh, it from UV radiation. UV radiation can damage the DNA and lead to dangerous mutations causing skin cancer. I bet you heard of melanoma. Melan in Greek word means black and oma is a word forming element. Now look closely what cells would be most vulnerable to UV radiation cells of light skin or cells of dark skin person? I believe that answer is obvious. The UV light more likely to hit DNA of a person with light skin. Look on the diagram. DNA of a person with a dark skin is protected while in a person with light skin, UV light can easily penetrate uh, the la thin layer of melanin. So, is it a good thing to have a light skin or a dark skin? I think from my previous explanation about the way evolution happens, you understand that a good or bad trait is purely depends on the environmental conditions. In the conditions with a high level of UV light, the dark skin is an advantage. However, in the environment where there is not enough sunlight, such as north, the dark skin is disadvantage. Why? Because we need vitamin D, also known as sunshine vitamin. Its precursor is made on the exposure to the sunlight. However, if the skin cells impenetrable for sun rays, that a precursor will not be made and vitamin D will not be produced. At least not enough. The body needs vitamin D to absorb calcium. Vitamin D and calcium are essential for healthy bones and other bodily functions. Did you hear about rickets? Rickets is the softening and weakening of bones, usually because of an extreme and prolonged vitamin D deficiency. 
So let's imagine our ancestors that lived hundreds of thousands years ago. In the north, to have a light skin was an advantage because there's not much. The sunshine, pale skin synthesize more vitamin D when light is scarce. So if the people with darker skin color would end up there, what would happen? They will be feeling, they will be feeling quite miserable and therefore they would produce less offspring. So at that time, there would be happen gradual decrease of population of people with dark skin. I hope you understand that I'm speaking hypothetically with focus only on one single trait. Eventually, this will lead to the extinct of the trait. We are not talking about our days. In our days, uh, you perhaps know that the vast amount of milk we buy contains artificially added vitamin D. So in our days, it is not a problem. But what could happen to the human ancestors of the light skin in the south, where there is high levels of UV radiation from the sun? Well, people with light skin would be in disadvantage. They will get skin burns that eventually will develop in skin cancer. That is why in those days you will not find people with light skin in the south. However, our ancestors were covered with thick layers of fur that protect the light skin from UV light. Look at the chimpanzees. They have light skin under the layers of hair. Perhaps the mutation of dark to dark skin allowed to lose the hair in the south without a problem to the health. Movement of human ancestors with light skin unprotected by hair allowed them to survive in the north because they had advantage trait of producing vitamin D. But as recent study showed, the mutation occurred and the trait of dark skin appears. Perhaps this helped our ancestors to lose a thick layer of hair and somehow this was an advantage as well. So, in days back, which are ancient people will leave more offspring? The ones with dark skin or with light skin? Of course, those that will be healthier in that particular environment. And that is people with the darker skin. However, in our days, the skin color is not that important. Why? because we mostly live inside the buildings and we know how to protect ourselves from unfavorable conditions. I just demonstrated you an example where the UV light was a selective pressure or another way to say selective force. This was another example of microevolution, not macro, but microevolution. I hope you understand the difference. Why these definitions macro and microevolution are important? It is because it allows you to understand how evolution happens in nature. Macroevolutionary change occurs due an accumulation of microevolutionary changes. If you still struggle to understand microevolution, there is another example that is used to be very popular in old books. This is a good example of observable evidence of natural selection. Here you see two moths that belong to the same species, but look a bit different from each other. Variability is very important for survival of population, as you know. Peppered moths of the species Biston bitularia range in color from mostly white with a peppered of black specks to nearly all black. At one time, the lighter colored moths of this species were the most numerous because they blended in with the light colored bark of the trees they favored and thus were nearly invisible to their bird predators. But because there was increasing industrial plants in the area, air pollution caused the dark of the trees to darken, exposing the lighter moths to the birds. The birds ate the more visible white variety leaving behind mostly the darker variety of the species which lay hidden on the soot darkened trees. This is evidence of microevolution in action or evidence of natural selection. Selective force here is the presence of predators. Once again, microevolution is a small scale changes that affect just one or a few genes and happens in populations over shorter time scales. 
macroevolution is a large scale changes that occur over extended time periods, such as the formation of new species and groups or taxa. What I gave you so far is a few basic definitions that might help you to understand the way a mechanism of natural selection works. Now I would like to bring your attention to a proof that evolution actually happens. Often people get confused and they say evolution is just a theory. No, it is not just a theory. It is a scientific theory. You see, in everyday life, when people say theory, they usually mean hypothesis, a speculative guess. In science, theory is an explanation that has been tested and widely accepted as valid. For example, cell theory states that all living things are made of cells. This is known as a cell, this fact is known as a cell theory. Same with theory of evolution. The statement that living things evolve is a fact in our days that had been proven over and over again. Now there is even a branch of science known as experimental evolution. Experimental evolution is the use of laboratory experiments or controlled field manipulation to explore evolutionary dynamics. Evolution may be observed in the laboratory as individuals' populations adapt to new environmental conditions by natural selection. In the future, I plan to have a whole lecture on this topic. Moreover, there is a comparative molecular analysis that provides additional proofs of evolution. But for now, let's take a look at the proof of evolution that had been available at the Darwinian time. This will help us to understand how Charles Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection and whether Darwin was alone in his findings. Traditionally, people in Christian Europe had believed that the world was about 6,000 years old. This view was guided by interpretations from the Bible, which itself gave no date for creation. By the early 19th century, it was widely understood that Earth could not be a few thousand years old, but must be inconceivably ancient. Now we know that Earth is about four and a half billion years old plus or minus about 50 million years. At Darwinian time, there were numerous findings of fossils. And what is interesting, these fossils were found in layers. Take a look for yourself. Some organisms were found embedded within one of these layers. Certain fossils were always found in the same layers of rocks. And ones on top are progressively younger. Most found in the oldest layers were very different from modern organisms. All these rocks contain only the most primitive fossils, seashells, fish appeared later, later reptiles. Today, scientists estimate over a thousand dinosaur species once roamed Earth. In later layers, we find birds and mammals. Look at this layer, one of the oldest one. In this oldest layer, there are no birds or mammals. We find here only invertebrates and jawless fish. There is no even a jawed fish in here. Jawed fish, amphibians, and first reptiles appeared much later. Then we find dinosaurs. No birds, no mammals, no humans. Dinosaurs only. Isn't it in the Bible there is a statement or dogma that all animals plants and humans themselves were created in six days. If this is true, then why don't we find humans in those old layers? Mammals appear much later, and eventually we find the remains of human bones. No one thought uh, that the Earth was old enough to allow sufficient time for the production of new species. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, is considered to be the founder of biology. He described wolves, deer, lions that are identical to those present in Europe for more than 2,000 years later. And this was the main argument of the creationists of that time. But 2,000 years is nothing on the scale of evolution. How old is the life on our planet? About 3.7 billion years old. Billion with B. The earliest life forms we know of were microscopic organisms that left signals of their presence in rocks about 3.7 billion years old. The signals consist of type of carbon molecules that produced by living things. 
So what is the logical conclusion of one might make looking at this record of fossils? The conclusion is that the different types of organisms had lived in various time in the past. With non-evolutionary explanation for fossils came up George Cuvier, the founding father of paleontology himself. He called it the a theory of catastrophes. He stated that the species of the modern world are the species that survived the catastrophes. But if he is right, then the different types of organisms should be all mixed together in the layers with first primitive organisms. We should find fossils of dinosaurs, birds, and mam mammals and humans. No such luck. So with all the respect to, this con to his contribution to science, his non-evolutionary explanation of fossils is not valid at all. Because if he is right, the older slayers should contain fossils of present today species. Another non-evolutionary explanation was proposed by Louis Agassiz. You see, vast majority of fossils are of the extinct species. So Louis Agassiz was saying that there was a new creation after each catastrophe, and that the modern species result from most recent creations. Is that means that there were 50 separate catastrophes and creations? I do not think this is a good argument. What do you think? Besides the fossil records, there were other observations made that supported the idea of evolution. One of them was made by Charles Lyell, Scottish geologist who demonstrated the power of known natural causes in explaining the Earth's history. His study showed that the Earth's inner heat could dramatically shape geologic features. And as of now, we know that is true. Before our continents were all together, the globes on the slide show how the Earth looked at different time periods. Early geologists came up with the theory of continental drift. Continental drift described one of the earliest way geologists thought continents move over time. Today, the theory of continental drift has been replaced by the science of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics explain why Earth's continents are moving. The theory of continental drift did not provide an explanation. Therefore, the theory of plate tectonics is more complete. The heat from radioactive processes within the planet's interior causes the plates to move sometimes towards and sometimes away from each other. The movement is called plate motion or tectonic shift. So the face of the Earth is changing constantly, causing the species of plants and animals to become isolated from each other and putting them to the different environment. Planet with oceans our continents and plate tectonics maximizes opportunities for speciation and natural selection, whereas the similar planet without plate tectonics provides fewer such opportunities. A plate tectonics uh, exerts environmental pressure that drive evolution without being capable of extinguishing all life. But in science, we are not satisfied with a few proofs. And as I said earlier, in, um, in order for a hypothesis to become a theory, there should be much more evidence. And here is one of them. What you see on this slide is morphological resemblance among living in our day's species. First look at the human upper limb. It has the bone called humerus. The same bone is found in dogs. The same bone is found in birds and even in whales. Moreover, we find ulna in humans, dogs, birds, and whales. Radius is also there. All these animals have radius. All these animals have carpals. Moreover, even though their limbs look different and have different functions, they all have metacarpals and carpals. Yes, humans have hands, dogs have paws, birds have wings, and whales have fins, but all these appendages have carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Look at the limb of the bat and limb of a mouse. Same things. Humorous. 
radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. The size and shape of the individual bones vary from species to species, and some bones may be missing entirely in one species or another, but the basic construction is the same. Darwin suggested that each of these species had descended from a common ancestor from which each had inherited the basic plan of its folly modified to suit its present function. We'll just look at the homology structures. Homology structures are the body structures in different organisms that are due to inheritance from a common evolutionary ancestor. You can see it for yourself right here on a slide. Morphological resemblance among living species are there. And the logical conclusions one can make is that species uh, may share similar physical features because the feature was present in a common ancestor. On front of you are homological structures. And why we call them homological is because they are very similar to each other. The word homo means the same in Greek. If we take a closer look at animal anatomy, we will find another proof that modern animals came from a common ancestor. Vestigial organs indicate such conclusion. Vestigial organs are remnants of lost functions that ancestors possess. One of the classical examples are hip bones in whales. What do animals that live in water need the hip bone for? It doesn't. These bones have no function for living in water. The only explanation why whales have hip bones is that their ancestors used to walk on land. But because of the competition for nutrients on the land, they went back to water. Why would certain snakes, such as the boa constrictor, have internal hind limb bones buried in muscles toward their tail ends? The only explanation can be is that their ancestors used to have legs. If the example of boa constrictor is not a good evidence of evolution for you, take a look at this, the skinks with and without limbs that coexist in the same damp tropical environment. If this is not convincing, how about these crustaceans, lobsters and barnacles? They look very different from each other, but are very close relatives. If you look at their larvae, you cannot deny their resemblance. Look, they look very similar. The barnacle larvae is a free living organism that is not attached to one place. This will happen later during their morphogenesis. Why would flightless birds such as penguins, ostriches and kiwis still have rudimentary wings or feathers for that matter? And again, the only logical explanation could be is that they have common ancestors that used to fly. The winds become either totally useless to them or they took a different role, not flying. For example, penguins. Penguins are birds, so they do have wings. However, the wing structure of penguins are evolved for swimming rather than flying in the traditional sense. Kiwi has tiny wings but cannot fly. It has loose feathers that are more like fur, and unlike other birds, the feathers mold throughout the year. So far, we look at paths of evolution when different environmental conditions diversified living organisms that once belong to the same species. This type of evolution called divergent evolution. From Latin dis meaning apart and vergere meaning to turn and is an adjectival suffix. Divergent evolution is a process by which an interbreeding population or species diverge into two or more descendant species, resulting in one similar or related species to become more and more dissimilar. Here is another example. The researchers think that about 50,000 years ago, the brown bear migrated to the north during the warmer climate period. And when a cold period subsequently set in, a group of brown bears may have become isolated and therefore forced to quickly adapt to a new colder conditions. 
as a cause of natural selection, their fur became white. Polar bear hair shafts are actually hollow, which allows the fur to reflect back the light of the sun. The polar bear has a long neck and a small head. Its long neck helps them to keep its head above water when bear swimming. But enough, enough of divergent evolution. I have been repeating myself over and over and over again. Enough. Evolution may take another pass. And instead making species look very different, it may make unrelated species look alike or similar. Look at these two organisms. They are not close relatives, but look very much as they are closely related. One of them is fish, the shark. And another is a mammal, like us humans, the dolphin. Sharks and dolphins have even similar dorsal fins. But why they look so similar? Because they ended up in the similar environment. This type of evolution called convergent evolution. From Latin converge to incline together. Convergent evolution is a process of natural selection in which features of organisms not closely related come to resemble each other as a consequence of similar selective forces. Look at these birds. One looking at them may assume that they are close relatives, but they are not. One is living in America and another is living in Africa. But despite the fact that they are in a very different location, they are living in the similar environmental conditions. So because of the natural selection and similar selective forces, they look very similar to each other. Deceivingly similar. Analogous structures are the structures that are similar because they were produced by convergent evolution, not because they descended from a common structure in a shared ancestor. Examples of analogous structure range from winds in flying animals like bats, birds, and insects, to fins in animals like penguins and fish. What you see here are wings, are structures that allow animals to fly. I hope you can see a difference between wings of bird and a butterfly. Does this mean that they are closely related because they have wings? I hope the answer for you is obvious. They are not. These wings have very different origin. By the way, wings of what animals are in the bottom of the slide? What is your guess? Did you get it? Fish, flying fish. Flying fish are ray-finned fish, which highly modi uh, modified pectoral fins. Despite their name, flying fish are not capable of powered flight. Though, once in the air, their rigid wings allow them to glide for up to 650 feet, 200 meters. The wing-like pectoral fins are primarily for gliding. The fish hold the fins flat at their side when swimming. Examples of animals that went through conversion evolution uh, uh, is overwhelming. I just want to move forward with the lecture and bring your attention to another proof that evolution happens. Remember, as I said in science, to turn a hypothesis into theory, we need proof that is overwhelming. Another proof that evolution happens and all of living things have a common ancestor we find in the studies of embryology. Embryology is the study of how living things develop from eggs or seeds to their adult forms. If you will look closely at human embryos, you will notice that human embryos have gill patches and well-developed tails that disappear before the time of birth. Obviously, the living things are repeating in their developmental stages, stages the features of their ancestors. The gill slits indicate that our ancestors used to live in water. Remember the fossil records? The fish appeared before life went to the, from the water to the land. The tail indicates that our ancestors used to have tails. As you know, most of the primates have tails. And now take a close look at these embryos. 
the development of the embryo is so nearly the same for all the higher animals that it is difficult to distinguish the embryos of the various animals in their early stages of development. Look, look for yourself. Am I right? A proof that living things have capability of change enormously comes from artificial selection. Artificial selection is an evolutionary process in which human consciously select for or against particular features in organism. For example, by choosing which individuals to save seeds from or breed from one generation to the next. People have been artificially selecting plants and animals for thousands of years. Darwin reasoned that if animals can be selectively bred by men to produce certain desired traits, then nature itself can select for limitless traits by process called natural selection. While breeders use intelligence to select for desired traits such as physical appearance or strengths, nature, in Darwin's view, selects for those traits that promote survival itself. Look at all the dog breads. They all members of the same species, bred from tamed wolves. Who could compare the colors and shapes of the wild roses to many colors and shapes of the far larger domesticated roses, which varieties bred each year and doubt that a species has capacity to change enormously, even in a hundred years? The wild species of Brassica caliracea has been bred to create cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage. Each represents a selective exaggeration of one part of the wild plant. The flower heads of cauliflower, the side buds for Brussels sprouts, and the leaves for cabbage. Does wild cabbage look anything like other kinds of cabbage initially bred from it? No. So, there should be no doubt that a species has capacity to change enormously. In everything Darwin looked at, fossils, anatomy, embryology, and breeding, he saw the same message. Species can and do change, but it is not good enough to say species evolve. Why? because there should be explanation of how this happens. There should be an answer on the question, what is the mechanism of evolution? Eventually he found the answer, natural selection, but how this happened? Well, Darwin was a very lucky man. What do I mean by this? He married a very, very wealthy woman. Darwin was married to his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. He had so much money marrying her that he did not have to work anymore. He could only do things that he liked to do, and he liked nature. He was a naturalist, a person who studies natural history. He had a big collection of different species of plants and animals. He observed nature. He thought about nature. Before he married, he went to a five-year voyage to South America and around the world uh, on the British Royal Navy ship called Beagle. It might seem strange to name a ship after a dog, but naming ships after animals was common practice for British Royal Navy. This ship is very famous because of Charles Darwin. In his time abroad on the Beagle, Darwin would describe and collect many new types of animals and plants. During his trip, he would constantly make notes. Later, during his marriage, most of the time he would hide them in his desk. He called them devil notes because of his observation contradicted the Bible. And his wife was very religious. He was afraid to hurt her feelings in his convictions that species change within time. So, on the beginning, he did not discuss this with Emma. 
When the Beagle arrived to the Galapagos Islands, Darwin started to study the wildlife of the Galapagos Islands. He noticed that the finches, sunbirds on the different islands there were fundamentally similar to each other, but showed a wide variations in their size, beaks, and claws from island to island. For example, their beaks were different depending on the local food source. Darwin concluded, that because of the islands are so distant from the mainland, the finches that arrived there in the past had changed over time. His observation were making sense because look here, the Galapagos Islands are thousand kilometers away from the continent. When these birds got to the island from the continent, they all ended up in a different environments. The uh, different islands had a different source of food for them. So the different population of birds developed different adaptations to the food source. This made Darwin realize that species evolve by the mechanism of natural selection. Take a look at these finches from Galapagos Islands. Actually, look at their beaks. Those that feed on the fruits have beaks that are very different from those that feed on insects or cactuses. And those that are feed on seeds have beaks different from those that feed on fruits and cactuses. So, source of the food at different islands determine the shape of the bird's beaks. Look, the birds with various types of beak arrive to one of the Galapagos Islands. This island has cactuses. No fruits, no seeds, no much insects. Food is type of selective pressure here. What is going to happen? The birds that have beaks that help them to get this kind of food will prosper. They will be healthy. They will fill up to reproduction. They will leave more offspring. They will pass their genes, so to say, traits to other generations. Darwin didn't know anything about the genes. What will happen to other birds with different beaks? They eventually going to disappear. Because they will leave less and less offspring and eventually the island will end up with the finches that have beaks suitable to feed on the cactuses. This is how the adaptation in population occurs, by weeding out the traits that are not suitable for the environment and leaving those that suit the environment. That is how Darwin came up with his concept, survival of the fittest, which suggests that organisms best adjust, adjusted to their environment are the most successful in surviving and reproducing. Charles Darwin proposed that evolution works on the theory of survival of the fittest. This means that individuals in population or community are more likely to survive if they fit in a genetic sense. If the offsprings inherit the successful characteristic from their parents, they too will do better and have more offspring. Gradually, over generations, the characteristic will spread through the population. Here in the Galapagos Islands, Jan Darwin realized that the mechanism of evolution is the natural selection. The nature selects the traits of living organisms. Like humans select favored traits via artificial selection. This was huge discovery not only for Darwin, but for the whole world. But he was not anxious to share his discovery with the world. He hesitated. He was afraid of the reaction that might come not only from his deeply religious future wife, but from the society. So on, so on the return from the voyage, he married Emma Widgwood without sharing his secret of his discovery. But there was another naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, now known as British naturalist, explorer, geographer, anthropologist, biologist, and on top of this illustrator. All his life he dreamed to visit South America. When he saved en enough money, he went there. But there he got malaria, disease caused by a parasite that, could, that passed to humans by mosquito bite. This disease causes spike in fevers, sick, and feeling very weak, all of a sudden he realizes that the mechanism of evolution is 
natural selection. He personally knew Charles Darwin, so he sent letter to him where on one page he shares with him his brilliant discovery. When Charles Darwin opens this letter, he is in a state of shock. Wow, it is him, Charles Darwin, who came up with the mechanism of evolution by means of natural selection. And now another naturalist claims the same discovery he did. But Darwin was a decent man. So he decided to do the following. He took the letter that he received and he took all his writings on the topic that is thousands of pages and brings all of this to the editor in chief of the one of the most prestigious scientific journal. And he says, look, I am the one who came up with the mechanism of evolution first. And look what happened. I had received a letter from a friend, another naturalist that independently came up with the same conclusion, the same mechanism I discovered. The editor of the journal also was a decent man. And he said, look what I will do. I will ask you to write an article on one page for the journal, and I will ask Alfred Wallace to write one page article in the journal. We will publish these two articles in the same issue of the journal. But then, since you work so much on the topic and wrote so much notes on it, I advise you to turn your notes into a book and we will publish it. This is how Charles Darwin wrote one of the most important book named on the origin of species by means of natural selection. This book was published in November 24, 1859. The scientific world was shocked. Finally, the evolution was explained. There was diverse opinions about Darwin's explanations. Society did not want to accept the fact that living things evolve. It is a hard for a lay man to understand many concepts described in the book that is over 300 pages long. In common press, the caricatures on Darwin were drawn. Darwin half man, half monkey or chimpanzee. But for the most scientists, there was no doubt that Darwin is absolutely right. Of course, the book was not perfect and there was awkward moments, but the main idea turned out to be Correct. In our days, there is more and more proofs appears almost on the monthly basis. The big surprise is how men who knew nothing about genes uh, were able to describe a mechanism that has purely genetic basis. To the end of his life, Darwin himself was doubting his theory of evolution. Ironically, there was a Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, who lived and worked at the same time and who discovered genes. He discovered genes by carrying on experiments with pea plants, and he did not use word genes. He called them factors. If only Darwin knew of his work, he would not doubt his own theory. However, Gregor Mendel had become famous only after he died. I wish he knew that in our days he would be called father of genetics. After the death of Charles Darwin in Darwin's library, there was a scientific journal found with an article of Gregor Mendel, which in our days considered to be the best scientific paper ever published. The next to uh, this, paper, this paper, there was one of many immature articles which had been all in Darwin notes on the side of the paper and underlines. But the Gregor's Mendel paper was left untouched and obviously unread by Darwin. What an irony, because as we know now, this article had all proof of Darwin's theory of evolution. The proof that Darwin was looking for most of his life. But let's go over the most important points in Darwin's book. Species arise from a succession of ancestors through a process of descent with modification. This is the idea that species change over time, give rise to new species, and share a common ancestor. 
mechanism of evolution is natural selection. Natural selection can lead to speciation, where one species gives rise to a new and distinctively different species. It is one of the processes that drives evolution and helps to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Darwin chose the name natural selection to contrast with artificial selection or selective breeding that controlled by humans. I talk a lot about natural selection in these lectures and I gave you many examples of how natural selection works. So if I add anything else to it, I am afraid you're going to protest. Perhaps it will be better to elaborate on the topic in my other lecture. Organisms compete to exist. Yes, organisms compete for the resources they need to survive. Air, water, food and space. In areas where these are sufficient, organisms live in a comfortable coexistence. In areas where resources are abundant, the ecosystem is boasting with species richness. Individuals with traits that aid survival live to reproduce and pass on those traits. This statement made by Darwin has a genetic base. Individuals and populations are naturally variable, meaning that they are all different in some ways. These variations mean that some individuals have traits better suited to the environment than others. Individuals with adaptive traits, traits that give them some advantage, are more likely to survive and reproduce. This individual and pass the adaptive traits on to their offspring. Over time, these uh, advantageous traits become more and more common in the population. Through this process of natural selection, favorable traits are transmitted through generations. Darwin did not know that genes exist, but he could see that many traits are heritable, passed from parents to offspring. Agus Weizmann, a German evolutionary biologist, showed that variation caused by the environment acquired traits could not be passed to offspring. Only genetic variation are passed on from generation to generation. This was a very important addition to the theory of evolution. What does this mean? Here is an example. If you go to gym on a daily basis and exercise building up muscles, these muscles cannot be passed to your offspring. The only thing you can pass is the genes you possess. One might lead a very healthy lifestyle, but if one gets genes that can cause some forms of diseases, one will be get these diseases. Obviously, I am not talking about infectious diseases, though. Some individuals might be susceptible to infections more than others because of their genes that determine their immunity. Mutations are changes in the structure of the molecule that make up genes called DNA. The mutation of genes in a, is an important source of genetic variation within population. Mutations can be random, for example, when replicating cells make an error while copying DNA or happen as a result of exposure to something in the environment, like harmful chemicals or radiation. Mutation can be harmful, neutral, or sometimes helpful, resulting in a new advantageous trait. When mutations occur in germ cells, eggs, and sperms, they can be passed to offspring. For more information on mutation, please see my lecture number 14. If the environment changes rapidly, some species may not be able to adapt fast enough through natural selection. Through studying the fossil record, we know that many of the organisms that once lived on Earth are now extinct. Dinosaurs are one example. And invasive species are diseases, a catastrophic environmental change, or highly success, successful predator can all contribute to the extinction of species. Today, human actions such as overhunting and the destruction of habitats are the main so cause of extinctions. Extinctions seem to be occurring at much faster rate today than they did in the past, as shown the fossil record. Today we know that there are four key mechanisms that allow a population to exhibit a change in gene frequency from one generation to the next. That is natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow. 
Last two we will discuss in the lecture after we will cover introduction to genetics. In nowadays, evolution is the key unifying principle in biology. As Theodosius Dobzhinsky once wrote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Thank you.